Let us continue on with user training. We're going to talk about role-based training. Specific individuals within the company are going to need specific training. We want to look at how to train employees in handling sensitive data and also how to apply training as an ongoing process. So one of the things that we always know is that if we have general employees, they're going to need to know how certain things work. I always love it when you come into an office and you go to work, they're going to have you read the security policy or this general policy for everybody. <clears throat> and the problem with that is that this policy is usually very long, a couple hundred pages long. People begin to read this and it's like, I have no idea what this thing's talking about. So my, my suggestion is always have about a three-page policy for them to read when they first get there. Give them a week to get oriented and then give them the really long policy because now they understand what they're reading. All end users have to go through role-based training to learn about the common threats that are out there, how to avoid them, doing things such as social engineering. Anytime you've got someone who is facing the customers, whether it be on the phone, whether it be in person, again, that individual is going to need to know some things about the social engineering and public reputation. We also have to think about the privileged users as we start looking at specific types of users or groups. We have to think about those individuals getting their specialized training. So privileged users, administrators would have their own types of training. You think about incident response teams. They need to be trained in how to respond to something. A big part of it's going to be the troubleshooting aspects of it, which is a, both a science and an art together. So you have to think about that instant response of figuring out what has happened, how did it happen, why, who might have done it, but more importantly, can we stop whatever attack was there or what it, whatever that incident was, prevented from continuing, get the person back online and get them working again. So that to us is the important part of this whole aspect. <clears throat> so you start thinking about the instant response team, where did they go to school, where did they get their education, how quickly can they respond to something. Again, upper management's gonna have their own thing. So again, the CISSP class is for mid managers, SISM is for your upper management group. So when they look at things such as their assets or their general threats, we have to make sure that upper management can respond to that. I love the fact that with the Department of Defense that you guys have your cybersecurity training. So we always talk about how to handle data, how you're supposed to handle this. And you think about the classification level that you're given. When you're creating the data, you're classifying it, so you're labeling it. How do you store that? Who's going to have access to it? What sort of permissions do you give it? give those individuals. There's some special data that should be handled appropriately. If it's PII, it's being handled usually by HR uh, or accounting. So we want to make sure that information is also being handled appropriately. So any customer or partner data also needs to be looked at. Data in transit, anything going across an unsecured network, whether that be going across a wireless environment, going across a Cat5 cable going across the internet and uh, coming out of your phone. Any of this needs to be encrypted going across. So the idea is that if it's data that you care about, data that's sensitive, it should be encrypted going across the wire. And then finally, how do we dispose of the data? So we start looking at, again, where is it stored? On what sort of interface is it? Is it going to be on a floppy disk? Is it a hard drive? Is it a uh, CD-ROM that we can shred? We start looking at these different aspects of the data itself and how we destroy that data or how we properly dispose of that data. Ongoing training. Training is continual. You're never going to know everything about every aspect of this industry. <clears throat> I've been in the industry now since 1984. And every time I teach a class, I learn something new. Every time I read something, I'm filling in some of the gaps that are out there. So ongoing training, your life is ongoing training. Every time you sit down and work on a system, you're starting to learn a little bit more of how things work on that system. 
So we always want to make sure that we reiterate to our end users that they maintain sufficiently secure passwords. Make sure that they know about the clean desk policy and any related training in that. Remind the users of existing policies on recreational programs, websites, or consider adding some new controls. They're talking about the fact that some of the games that you get on are embedding things inside of your system. So you always want to make sure that if you're taking your laptop home that you're not using it for something like gaming. When you're using your mobile device, make sure that you have clearly defined mobile device policies and proper training for that. So again, you want to make sure that the end user's mobile devices that they're using for work that may contain some of our data are being secured properly. Train the end users on the social engineering pitfalls. IRS just has a new video that's come out that they were talking about this morning on the morning news that has the 12 new scams of the IRS. So you can go watch it for one of two reasons. Either you want to pull off these scams with somebody else or you want to defend yourself from these scams from someone else. So taking a look at those scams is always important to see how someone is doing it. Most of it's going to be social engineering. So if you have elderly parents, you might want to help them out and say, let's not let you fall prey to some of these folks out there that want to steal your money. So the scams, the phishing attempts, people are trying to always do something to get your money. I remember my mom, when she was alive, used to call me up all the time and she'd go, okay, I got this thing in the mail that says that I've won one of three things, either a new car, a television, or a new washing machine. So what color new car would you like? Like, Mom, what are you talking about? Oh, they sent me this in the mail. I'm a winner. It says right here, I'm a winner. I said, Mom, you remember when uh, your aunt Virginia used to get these? You used to laugh at her about how stupid it was that she fell for this? She goes, no, it says right here, I'm a winner. Mom, it's a scam. Not going to happen. I said, unless you know who's putting on this contest, unless you're related to them or you're dating them, you're not going to win this thing. So... Get it out of your head that you don't send them anything. So you always got to look at those phishing attempts. People are going to try to, to lure you in to do something. There's always the importance of enabling the security controls after maintenance. So again, anytime we have updated something, we've put in the updated operating system, we've put in our patches, always go back and make sure that your security is back up to date. So we've got some questions for you. What kind of security training is most important for a company executive? So they need to know the overall security picture so they can make sure that the organization creates solid policies and ample funds, amply funds the security controls and procedures. So the overall awareness answer, bravo, is what we're looking for. What standards do you need when handling credit card data? Oh, you said that in unison. I like that. Very good. PCI DSS. Users should have both permissions and need to access sensitive data, whether technically able to or not. That is true. So that's a basic policy that we have. Permissions and need to know. What kind of an employee is most likely to need extra training about social engineering attacks? My receptionist needs the extra information. Anybody who is facing the public should have that. So this next module talks about physical security and safety. We we're going to talk about the location and the facility constraints on physical security. We'll talk about surveillance systems, how to secure the entranceways and equipment, how to protect the equipment and personnel within environmental controls, and we're going to talk about fire suppression systems that we have. As we take a look at the physical access that we have, you're going to have a fence that's going around your facility. You're going to have a gate up front. Hopefully you have a guard up front. When you're coming into the parking lot, you find your parking spot, you walk into the building, you've got that zone two, which is the building interior. You're going to have some sort of a swipe card or pin to get in, or maybe a guard sits inside. When you're coming into the server room, same thing. There's going to be a card requirement and or a pin to get in. So we're looking at the fact that you're going to have to go through three sets of zones and control mechanisms to get inside of the server room. 
So the more physical access control we can put in place, the better it's going to be. So some of the concerns that we always have anytime we are looking at a location for our building, we're looking for how much crime is in the area. Where can I go to get the crime statistics for an area? Police department's going to have that for you. So you can go and find out how much crime is in that area, what types of crime are in that area. How does this location handle certain types of disasters? If you had flooding, if you're close to a river and you're concerned about the river rising and the flooding, that would be a concern that you might have. Is this an area that's going to see hurricanes or tornadoes? Are you concerned at all about ice storms, blizzards? You might get that in this area. Uh, these are some of the considerations. Are you too close to an airport? Are you too close to a military base? Yes, because yes, you're here. Yes. Uh, are you too close to a railroad track that's going by? Because railroad tracks, uh, freeways, our transportation corridors, and a lot of times they'll send things like nuclear rods down there that are on their way to be disposed of. There's going to be gas and oil containers going down those streets and down those tracks. So you have to be concerned about the disasters that could potentially occur because of your location. We think about utilities. How close are the utilities? The water, the gas, the electric. Do you have a gas pipeline running through the area? How close are emergency services? That becomes an issue, especially when you start thinking about, let's see, if they're going to have to get on base, they're going to have to go through the gate over here. They're going to have, well, wait a minute, we do have some emergency services here on base. These are some of the things that we think about. The perimeter fence, the wall, the different heights. We have three-foot fences, five-foot, eight-foot, 15-foot. NIST and the NSA have certain regulations. That would be eight foot tall fencing with concertine, three strands of, of barbed wire up on top, or as they call it in Germany. Anybody know the German name for barbed wire? Strockeldraht, Strockeldraht, I think it is. Anyway, um, you have to think about how sturdy this is. If somebody hits this with their vehicle, will it knock down the fence and can you get in? I thought it was interesting when I was storing my routers and switches and firewalls up here when I was doing my classes. So I found a storage unit that was over on Rolling Road, right over by the Social Security area there. And I wanted to make sure I had 24 by 7 access to this facility, but I also wanted to make sure it was in a good location. So Rolling Road isn't the best location in the world, but there was one facility that was right next door that added to this level of security that I wanted. What was this? It was a donut shop. Why a donut shop? Because cops at 2 o'clock in the morning hang out there. There you go. So I found myself on occasion at 2 o'clock in the morning flying into Baltimore, getting my rental car and driving up there. And who's sitting right there? The cops are just, I'm like, this is perfect. What I thought was interesting, though, was because it snows quite a bit here in the Baltimore area, they have two fences or two, a, a double gate in the back. So what they would do is they would open the gate to the outside, they would push the snow out, and then they couldn't close the gate. Why do you have a fence up there if you can't close the gate? They should open it to the inside, push the snow out, and then close it. Otherwise, people could just walk over the snow and get inside. I'm just like, God, really? You put the fence up there, you put the gates up there, but you don't think about locking it so you can't close it. Some people just don't think that far ahead. Think about those sensors, the cameras that you have. So many of the cameras that we have are motion sensors. So if you are moving in front of the camera, it turns the camera on and we can capture that information. So as we start thinking about the sensors that we have on the windows, the doors, uh, even up on the roof that somebody's moving up there, we'll get that so that we can keep somebody out. Visibility becomes real important. If you are sitting up on top of something, you've got the high ground, you're looking down, but if you're down in the valley, somebody can see down inside what you're doing. They can see people that are around the area, the movement that they have. So you always look at the visibility. 
On the Discovery Channel, they had a TV show called It Takes a Thief. Anybody ever see that? These two guys were convicted felons for breaking and entering. But the uh, Discovery Channel hired them to do some breaking and entering on Long Island. So they'd go up to the, the producers would go up to somebody and go, hey, do you think your house is secure? They're like, yeah, my house is really secure. Nobody's ever going to break in here. So they bring these two B&E guys in there to break into the house. The first thing they do is they go up and they use Google Earth. And they look down on this house. What they're looking for is a fence in the back, maybe a grove of trees in back to drive their ATV through to come up to the fence. Then they're going to use Street View to see if it's got an upstairs, because most people leave their upstairs windows open. So the one show I did watch, these guys came up to the fence in back, jumped with their ATV, jumped over the fence. They grabbed the picnic table, slid it right up to the house, jumped on top of the picnic table. They're on the roof. And they remember seeing in one of the pictures a dog. So what do you bring for the dogs? Doggy treats, little hot dogs. So they're up there throwing hot dogs in through the door. And of course, they've already put cameras in the house so that the owners sitting far away can watch this. And they're like, come on, Bowser, go get those guys. And Bowser's sitting there by the window, you know, just wagging his tail going, you got any more treats? You got any more treats? And they just kept throwing the treats in there. And Bowser is following them throughout the entire facility going, you got any more? It's wonderful. So the next thing they do is they start opening up the closets and whatnot upstairs. They find an empty suitcase and they start throwing stuff inside. They break the frames of pictures, they cut out the picture, they roll it up, put it inside of the suitcase, and then they go to the next room, they open up the closet door, and there it is, the Martin guitar. So they reached out over and they grabbed that and went, oh. So as they come down the stairs, they're now in the kitchen. What do people hang in the kitchen? Car keys. So they grab the car keys, and then they go down the stairs into the garage, and they just went, oh, my God. It's a 1962 Corvette Stingray, T-top. So they pop the T-tops, put it in the passenger side, throw the suitcase and the Martin guitar in the passenger side. The one guy has the keys to the car, and he says, you can take the ATV back home. I'm taking this. <laughs> and the owners were pissed. They could hear their cars starting up. They're like, no, not the car. They're taking my car. They get all this stuff back, and they come in and they secure the facility. But you start looking at that visibility. Someone can breach your visibility through something like Google Earth and Earth View or Street View because they can take a look at your facility to see what would the entrance points be, how can I get into your facility. When we think about barriers, we think about things like the ballards. The ballards are the large round devices that are in the ground that keep you away from the building itself. So most of the ballards that I see are permanent. You do have some that will either slide down into the ground so you can drive over it, then they come up again, or they'll be on slides which allow them to move. Down in New Orleans, when you go down Bourbon Street, they have two that are permanently there and two that are behind it that are on slides. So they got a little track that'll bring them right up front. So then you have the four ballards in a row so someone can't drive their car through there. So at 5 o'clock every evening, they put the ballards out so someone won't go crazy and drive down Bourbon Street. So those barriers become important. You can also put large planters out in front of buildings, and that'll keep people away as well. As we think about these secure, secure doors and windows, you always have to think about the windows and the fact that if the window doesn't open up, you don't have to worry about someone trying to break in through the window. Uh, on the other hand, if you happen to have either a sliding window or a window that opens out, there are pretty easy ways to break into those windows. You think about the doors that you have. You think about the uh, fire rating that you've got in this building. On the walls we have here, this is drywall. It's probably going to be a 2x4 wall or a 2x6. If it's a 2x4 wall, this is going to be a 1-hour wall. If it's a 2x6 wall, it's called a 2-hour. That's how long it takes for the fire to burn through that. You want to make sure that your doors also meet that same fire requirement. You will notice in our doors, we actually have a 
steel door frame around that, that's what you want because somebody's going to bust their shoulder trying to break through the frame. So you always want to make sure that you get a, have a good solid uh, door and good solid windows in your facility. How many of you have been out to Germany? Why is it in Germany when you have the windows where the latch comes a quarter of the way down and you open the window this way so the top comes down, push it up and then bring it all the way down, now the, the window opens completely. Why don't we have that here in the States? I don't care about the expense, I want the window. I've never found anybody here that does these. I'm gonna have to ship them over from Germany and then rebuild the house around the windows. So yeah, I looked at that and I went, God, these are the greatest windows in the world, but I've never seen them in the States. So you always have to think about the walls going from the floor to the ceiling. So if we had the false ceiling we have up here, back along there, you would want to make sure that the wall that we have here goes all the way up to the ceiling so someone can't go up over the ceiling and into the room next door. Lighting becomes real important to us, especially outside at night. Again, lighting in a parking lot should be eight feet tall and offer two lumens of are two foot candles of luminosity. Luminosity is a measure of brightness that we have. When we think about our buildings, we need to know the escape routes. So you always want to make sure that your escape routes are visible and accessible by people. They had me teaching three months ago over at the Pentagon. They had me down in the basement and I started looking at these escape routes. When you take a look on a plane at the escape routes, what do they tell you about what happens when it's either nighttime or there's smoke in the plane? Where would you see, where would you go to find the way out of the plane? You look down the bottom, why? And when it changes from white to red, that's where the doors are and that's where you would go out. Well, I was impressed when I saw this in the Pentagon, I saw then when you walk in the door in this small area, the hallway right out in front of my classroom, that they had lines. They, they actually had uh, bioluminescent arrows across the bottom of the floor. So on this wall, it pointed in that direction. When you got to that wall, it pointed in this direction. When you got to this wall, it pointed in this direction. When you got to this wall, it pointed right back over to there, which meant that you're just going to sit there and go in circles. Not once did they point up to say, this is the door to the stairs, this is where you exit. Well, if you're in the basement, you're finished. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I deserve that one. Um, yes, you're right. So I mentioned this to my class. I said, this is rather funny because it was a CISSP class. And about two days later, I can hear some people outside, and they're actually changing it so it actually had some pointers going up so we could actually see. And they actually put a luminescent sign on the door that said exit. Yes, somebody who actually listens to something that is a suggestion. My cameras, we have a lot of different types of cameras. The cameras are gonna usually sit outside. You might have them in your hallway. If they're sitting outside, we do have cameras with lenses that are night vision. We also wanna think about if it's just a regular camera, if we put it outside, we want a wide angle lens. We also want an iris that is auto iris instead of a fixed iris. During the day, the iris will come down because it's very bright. At night, it needs to open up. So a fixed iris would never work. You want to have a wide angle lens and a auto iris that is maneuvered by how much light is outside. So many times we try to hide the cameras. That's tough to do. A lot of times we'll include it with some lights that are there. Um, the thief is going to know, one, where the cameras are. Secondly, is going to know where the dark spots are, where they can come in behind the, the, the camera itself, so they know the blind spots. They can come in uh, usually at night in a spot where there's no illumination, and they're behind the cameras, so you can't see them anyway. They're going to go up and then cover the camera so they can now walk around freely and get into your facility. So again, some of them are motion sensor. For our alarms and sensors, we can have motion sensors. We have window and door alarms. So when a door is opened, uh, within 10 seconds, the alarm goes off. It could be a pressure plate that you're stepping on. It could be glass gets broken. It could be an environmental alarm. So again, for temperature or humidity. Probably the best surveillance system out there is the security guard when you have a 
security guard shack. You'll have two guards, usually one in the shack and one who's wandering around the facility. So one is roaming, the other one is stationary. The one who's stationary is usually going to have feeds coming in for the cameras, feeds coming in for alarms in the building, and for fire alarms and 911 calls. So the guard is the one who makes that decision as to whether or not to call in everyone else. Yes, guards can get caught up sitting there watching that stuff all the time. As you're coming into your entranceways, we've got conventional locks. When I was over in Bahrain, I had an uh, English bloke in my class. He was so funny. He would sit there in class, and he had a pile of locks on one side. So he had a pile of locks on the right side. And he'd grab a lock, and he'd put it behind his back, doot, 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 and then he'd put the lock over here. It was open. He'd grab another lock, and he kept doing this. I'm like, what are you doing? He said, I'm getting ready for Sears training. So one of the things that we have to do is get through some gateways that have locks on them, so I'm working on my skills behind so I can't see because we do this at night. So I want to make sure that I can break through the lock if I have to. And he just... He's going through a half dozen locks in five minutes. I'm like, this is amazing. So I said, can you show me how to do this? So he's showing me how to use the little, um, what do you call those? Picks to get in there. The other thing he had was this little thing. He slides in the lock and then spins it and then just pops it. It's a little piece of plastic. It's amazing how unsecure locks are. So we always have to think about the conventional locks that we've got. The electronic locks are starting to get much better. Uh, it requires that you have a passcode on it or an ID badge. You could have an electronic token. It could be looking at biometrics. Anytime you have a lock, if you look at the doors behind us, we have what is known as a fail safe versus fail secure. If we got locked into this room and there were a fire, we could still leave because I can push on those bars and it will open the door and let me out. So you always want to make sure that whenever you go into any room, you look around to see how do I exit this room? Should there be a fire or an earthquake or something? And make sure that the doors are fail safe versus fail secure. Because if somebody locks those from the outside and doesn't let us push the bars, then we're not getting out of here. We also think in the secure entranceways, you're going to have guards. The guards are there to check your ID to make sure that you are who you say you are. There may be a man trap that you go through. You're going to use one form of authentication to open the first door, a different form of authentication for the second door. Man traps will either have a guard watching you go through or a camera on you to watch you go through. So when I come into a building, first thing I need to do is sign in. So there's always logging. When did you come in? When did you leave? Where were you and what were you doing? All of that goes there. And when they give me a badge, they take my driver's license. I gotta to remember to get my driver's license back before I leave because when I arrive at the next location, I might need a rental car. If I don't have a driver's license, I get no rental car. We wanna make sure that we secure our equipment, the network hardware rooms that we have. So anytime we've got a server room, we wanna make sure that that room is secure. So any equipment that's in that room also needs to maintain that level of security. So if somebody's coming into my server room, I want to make sure that they've got proper access to get in. If they're going to get into any of my devices, my routers, my switches, my firewalls, my access points, that they also have the required authentication to get into that. So we always think about the hardware locks. Sometimes we may have a locked safe inside of our server room. This might be there to hold backup tapes that we have or operating systems that we've got. Um, I'm not sure what else you might put in that. We think about the wireless access points. I noticed that we have access points here, but I also noticed out in the hallway there's one that's sitting over here. It's got six antennas on it. So I know it's either going to be an N radio or an AC radio because those are the only two types of access points that use the MIMO technology. MIMO stands for multi-in, multi-out. So by having six antennas up there, they'll use three antennas for broadcast and three for reception. So that's why we have multiple antennas on these. 
So you want to make sure that it's high enough that someone can't just reach up and gain access to that access point. We think about the network outlets that we've got over here. And we think about the cables. So the network outlets and the cables become important because if I bring my own cable in here, if I go open up that black case, I can take out a cable. Am I allowed to take out the cable, plug into your network outlet, and connect my laptop into your network? How quick? Oh, I'm allowed to do this, but how quickly from the time I do that is somebody going to be standing at that door looking for me? We're going to take bets on this. Anybody think 35 or 40 seconds? Nobody's coming? Oh, they're just going to shut the port down, really? Ah, you guys are no fun. Where's the guns? Where's the guards? When do I get to see the inside of your prison? The guns and guards are in the basement? See, I didn't have to socially engineer that, did I? He gave that up without me even having to take out the bungee sticks for your fingers. So you always have to think, can somebody just come up to a cable, cut the cable and put two ends on it, and then put a hub in the middle and capture that data? Absolutely. We also have to think about the social engineering side of things. Can somebody socially engineer their way into the building, into the basement, into the basement with the guards and the guns? So yeah, is that possible? Of course it is. That does happen. We talked about the HVAC systems and the fact that in our server room, we want to maintain a certain level of temperature in there. We want to keep it around 70 degrees. Some people feel it should be a lot cooler. 55 is perfect for me. That's t-shirt weather. And if you said yesterday when we came out of here it was 55 degrees, it might have been, but when you came around that corner over there, wow, that wind kicked in. Woohoo! So yeah, you want to keep the temperature in your server room down. We also have to think about that humidity because if it gets too humid, we get condensation. If it gets too dry, what do we get? Static electricity. When we take a look at the, the picture that we have here, we've got an airflow coming through, the hot and cold aisles. So you've got the AC coming in to your server racks on both sides. So then you are collecting it, the outgoing or the exhaust coming out of those two server stacks and you're pushing it out the hot aisle. So you got a cold aisle, hot aisle, so that we can cool our systems most efficiently. Most buildings have a certain amount of cooling capacity that they can handle. You can't add more cooling capacity. It all is predicated on how large the building is, how much space you have in the building, how much electricity is bound for that building. Because the cooler you make it, the more electricity you're going to use. HVAC systems need to be aware of any sudden change in the temperature and or the humidity so they can react to that. If they can't react to it, we've got to start shutting down systems. So you always have to be very concerned about heat and too much heat inside of your computer room. When we think about electromagnetic interference, we have a lot of electromagnetic interference that comes from many different sources. I've got some fluorescent lighting above me. It puts out both radio frequency interference and electromagnetic interference. If I think about my cables going across, sitting on top of those uh, fluorescent lights, if it's an unshielded twisted pair, it needs to sit at least 18 inches above. It's, if it's shielded twisted pair, it can sit right on top of that. And the shielding is going to actually prevent both the electromagnetic interference and radio frequency interference from affecting the data going through the wire. If we think about sources like a motor, electric motors put out a lot of EMI. I always think EMI is sitting on the bottom because the electric motors are usually sitting on the ground, whereas my fluorescent lights are up above. So RFI above and EMI below, you do get a little RFI above. But we have other ways that we can protect these. So when we look at things like motors and microwaves, HVAC systems, any industrial equipment that's using a lot of power, you're going to get these different electromagnetic interferences coming out. So you can use shielded cables, as I'm doing up in the, the uh, plenum area by putting a shielded twisted pair up there. I can use a Faraday cage or bring that cage all the way around. 
Uh, we do that in a lot of the training facilities I go to overseas. A lot of times they'll ask if I've got something that's putting out any wireless signal, such as a Wi-Fi signal, um, infrared, anything like that. And they want me to make sure I turn all that off before coming into their facility. Once I get in, I even notice my phone has no bars. And the reason for that is because they have a Faraday cage built in around the building that I'm in, so or the room that I'm in. That's going to prevent any signals from getting out. We also have Tempest standards. In the old days, when we had the cathode ray tubes, the big monitors that we had, you could sit behind the monitor and we could actually use a tool to scan your system or your monitor and we could actually watch the lines being built going across. We could actually read your data going across with these. The Tempest standard is going to prevent that from happening. It's really difficult to do that nowadays with the flat screens that we have. So we're getting to a point where our systems are a lot more secure. You need to know the different fire extinguishers that we've got out there, the Class A, Class B, Class C, Class D, and Class K. As we take a look at a Class A fire, that's going to be wood and paper. If you don't have a Class A fire extinguisher, water works just fine. Class B is going to be liquids. It's going to be things like tars or oils catching on fire. You've got to be very careful with that, especially when it's hot liquid that's on fire and you blast it with your fire extinguisher, you may spread that fire. That's really the problem with kitchen fires is because you've got the oils that are burning on your stove and you take that fire extinguisher and you blast it, you might push that all over your house. So the best thing you can do is what? Cover it. Just put that lid on or grab another pot, another pan and lay it right over the top of it. Just make sure there's no oil in that pan when you're doing that, okay? Class C is an electrical fire, so you want to make sure that you are using a Class C fire extinguisher on electrical fires, not water. You will get electrocuted using water on a fire. You don't want to do that. Class D is for metals. The type of metals we're talking about are things like magnesium that burn at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. If you think about your car, when I was growing up, my dad showed me how to fire off a flare. So you kick off the flare and you put it out in the street. That's going to give people notification at night that there's an issue or a problem up ahead. This is burning magnesium at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. I've actually seen somebody fire off the flare and set it down on the roadway, and I watched the roadway catch fire. They put too much oil into uh, whatever they put on the road top there and you see this flame coming up off the street and you're going good we're going to burn down a bunch of cars this is wonderful when you buy a fire extinguisher the thing to look for with a fire extinguisher is that it is a class a b c fire extinguisher if it's a class d metals you can put that in sand if you were to jump into the ocean with a flare in your hand what would you see underwater a burning flare it's going to pull the oxygen right out of the water and use that to keep the flare alive. So you will actually see people doing that in cave diving. They'll take a flare out and start going through the cave. It's actually very beautiful to see that. But again, uh, me hot metals are not going to be put out with water. you got to use sand to do that. How many of you have used a fire extinguisher? A couple of you. If you want to try out a fire extinguisher, all you got to do in fact, you got a fire station right across the street. Call them up and say, we'd like to do a fire exercise tomorrow afternoon at 2 in the afternoon. They will ask you how many employees you have. i got 120 employees. They will show up with 125 fire extinguishers, all sorts of different types of fire for you to practice on. Why are they bringing a fire extinguisher for every person in your office? They want to train you. Why? What's their thought process? Why are they spending the money to recharge those fire extinguishers? So they can get more money in their budget for next year. I like that. That's very good. What's it cost the fire department on average to send a truck and a couple of other guys out to your house? 
put out a fire? A couple grand right off the bat. Might go up to 10,000 depending on how many trucks have to show up. Would they rather spend a couple hundred bucks recharging a bunch of fire extinguishers, teaching you how to put out your own fire so they don't have to come out? Absolutely. So yeah, they don't mind at all. It's gonna cost them 50 cents to recharge this. They do so many of them at a time. They'll come out and keep letting you try these things until you feel comfortable. The reason behind this would be you have a fire in the room, they think you're going to go out, grab the fire extinguisher, come back in and put that out. You might just decide to exit the room. We have sprinklers in here. Yep, I'm looking at how, how spaced out they are. The idea of having this many sprinklers in a room is if we have a fire right here, once this gets hot enough, the little piece of plastic up there will melt and the water will isolate and put out just this fire right here. So if it gets hot over there, that one will go off as well. So the idea of sprinklers are great, except for one thing. What holds the water inside of the sprinkler head? Why doesn't it let this through? It's a little rubber grommet in there that holds the water back there. So my parents at their house got a notification that the rubber, rubber grommet in their um, Zern Industries, no, I'm sorry, Tyco Industries fire, uh, fire sprinklers was degrading because of ozone in our atmosphere. So they said, we will replace all of your sprinklers for free. Two days after they replaced the sprinklers, the one that was the highest in their house, which was 14 feet off the ground, cut loose and started spraying their house. So I taught my dad, whenever there's an earthquake, dad, there's three things you want to shut off at your house. What are those three things? What's one of them, Stephen? Water. Water. What's another one? Gas. What's the last one? Electricity. Water, gas, electricity. So I'd sit there at my parents' house and I'd just go, we're having an earthquake, we're having an earthquake. What would you do? And I got my parents in the habit of running outside shutting off the water, the power, and the gas. So all of a sudden, the house starts, the sprinkler cuts out, cuts loose, water's coming down, what's my dad do? Starts banging on the table. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he runs outside and he shuts down the water, the power, and the gas, but the water's still coming. Can anybody tell me why? Because what? Yes and no. Yeah, it's in the piping, but if you just shut it off out there, it's going to stop coming out pretty quick. And if you turn off the electricity, it's failing. Water coming into your house is split into two parts. One that goes up to your sprinkler system. The other one comes to the valve that then goes to your house. When you shut off the valve to your house, you still have the one from the street coming directly into your sprinklers. No matter what you do with this valve over here, it's not going to stop this. You've got to go to the street, turn off the water at the street. Took my dad 40 minutes to figure that one out. How much water came down on the house? Thousands of gallons. Now, I'm sharing this with you, one, to let you know that there's, you've got to turn it off the street. But secondly, I find out afterwards, because I was talking to a fire marshal about this, and he said, oh, man, all you had to do was call down the fire department. We'll come up, we got squeegees, man. We'll just come in and squeegee out your house. We got vacuums that'll pick up water out of your carpet. We have big fans that we'll leave with you for a week to dry out your house. All you had to do was call us. Found out too late, but if that ever happens to you or your family members, now you know how to handle this. Now, in many instances in our server rooms, we don't have sprinklers because water and electricity don't mix too well so what do we do instead in our server rooms? We're going to put gas. So either halon, CO2, intergen, FM200, which is the replacement for halon. Halon is no longer a good viable mechanism for putting out fires. It's a great mechanism for putting out fires, but it's not real human compatible. So if you're running halon in your server room, it's going to happen, Stephen. Yeah, they're going to suffocate. So one of my students a couple weeks ago told me that 
they had a contractor in their server room. He's coming out and his arms are full and they have a button between the inside door and the outside door <clears throat> so that if you had a fire, you push the button and, and it launches the halon. So he thinks it's the button to open the outside doors. So as he's leaving, he takes his elbow when he bumps this thing and all of a sudden they could hear the halon starting to release in there and there were people inside. They're like, oh my God, we've got to get out of here. They were able to shut most of it down, but a couple of them were just kind of a little woozy when they came out. They're like, God, another two minutes, another 20 seconds, they probably would have been dead. So halon will remove all of the oxygen out of the air, the same with CO2. So you want something like FM200 or Intergen, which is then going to supersaturate you with something that won't let the fire continue. When we think about fires, the biggest problem we have with electricity and the fires is that that distribution box that you have where the power comes in to your house or your building comes down the distribution box and then you've got all of your breakers in there that go out to your rooms and different floors. That is the box, the distribution box, that's going to usually catch on fire because somebody has decided to draw too many amps out of one of those. So we started thinking about coordinating the security and safety within our building. So we want to consult the building layout to compare the security areas and the fire escape routes. So you always want to make sure that you know how to get out of the building. Use a fail open lock to enable safe escape. So again, we want to make sure people can just simply push that bar and get out of the building. Use alarmed one-way emergency exits. Every airport I've been in always says, if you push the bar right here, wait 10 seconds, then you can continue to push to exit the building. So if a plane breaks its axle on its landing, the plane starts to tumble and break apart and starts coming right towards your terminal, you want to get away, you might have to push one of those things and get out. Realize sometimes they say it takes 10 seconds before the door will actually open. So you always want to look around and say, if there were something that happened up on the runway, which direction would I go? You want to use a separate alert system for security and for the safety emergencies. So if somebody's going out through that door and that alarm goes off, there should, that should be a different alarm than what the uh, guards are going to get at the front gate when they have a alert of, I don't know, someone being shot or, I don't know, a robbery occurring inside of the facility. Regularly conduct your emergency drills with your employees. The more times people see these emergency drills when the real emergency happens, it's real simple. I know what to do. Boom, boom, boom. Let's just go ahead and do this and get everybody to safety. Uh, I watched something rather interesting the other night on TV. It was at one of the ski lifts and they pick you up at the ski lift and then all of a sudden they pick you up and there was an eight-year-old kid that started falling out of the chair. Did you see that? How did they rescue him? I didn't watch the whole video. They, they, they used, used the part of the fence. Yeah, they got the fence because they, they put fences up in front of the poles so that you were coming when you're coming down the hill on your skis that if you lose control, you're not going to hit the pole you'll hit their little fence first. So it's just a little tied down fence there that will slow you down from hitting the pole. So these guys immediately grabbed this thing, ran over, and there were probably, what, 20? Did you see it, like 20 people around holding it? I think it was like the, the five, it was only like five little boys that came up with the idea. That it was really? Because I didn't see that part of the video. I just saw that they had used that, and I went, God, those people are smart. No, they were like 13. And they just thought about that right away. Boom, let's do this. Wow. What's that? There you go. 
We would play you the video, but we don't have internet access, unfortunately. Okay, we got a couple questions for you here. What class of fire extinguisher is most useful next to the server closet? I hope it's going to be a class C for fires. What qualifies as both a preventative and a detective control? That's my security guard. What are hot and cold aisles designed to assist? Air circulation in the server room. One server closet has particular sens particularly sensitive equipment that's suffering EMI due to a nearby electric motor. You can't really move either the equipment or the motor, so what option might help? Cage. Faraday cage. Fail closed door locks are bad for safety, but good for security. So it's actually C. Because it's going to keep it secure, but it's not good if you want to try to escape out of the building. In a building floor plan, you see lines representing the protected distribution system. What is this used for? It is Delta, the unencrypted data. So PDC is sending some unencrypted data across the wire. In this chapter, we took a look at how to design and document effective security policies, including acceptable use, passwords, personnel management, change management. We also took a look at the business plan agreements with security in mind. We looked at how to enforce security policies and best practices through role-based employee training how to revise policies and training procedures over time. We then looked at how to choose the appropriate physical security and environmental controls to help protect the facility, the equipment, the data, without endangering the safety of the employees. I'm going to send around another list right now. The thing to think about with this list are twofold. One, everyone must sign this list. Let me repeat that so that you understand. Everyone must sign this list because over the next two weeks, you are required to have taken the exam. We need to turn this into upper management because this is going to say whether you passed or failed. I've already filled that out. You have all passed your exams. Now, don't let me down because if I have to go print this out again, it's going to cost me some money, okay? Me and Sandy got this bet going on, so I got to keep up my reputation here. That you guys will all pass, because I'm now two for two for the last two classes I've taught every one of my students that took the exam on the last day passed. And what about the classes before that, though? As I said, I'm two for two. Yeah. Um, before that, it was like 80% of them passed. <laughs> so, have you ever had 40%? Yes, I have had 40%. Okay, good. And these were the people that did not speak English. <laughs> well, I don't speak English. I just get it. So, I can give you the questions, I can give you the answers, but whether or not they stay in your head from the time that you reviewed them. To the time that you took the test is always, you know, questionable. As long as the test I get has all the answers. For your fans, they missed you today. That's fine. You can administer the test to anybody right now. You give us the answers. Send it in. Why don't I just take the test for you, Richard? There it is. Problem yeah, solved. Yeah, forever. This is never going away. <laughs> I'm going to look under my keyboard right now. If there's what I think there is there, I'll be happy to do that. Should I look? Is there something there for me? Leave the room real quick. Leave the room real quick. <laughs> okay, here's what I need you to do. I need everybody to sign this. If you are planning on taking the test tomorrow, because I have to turn this in before 2 o'clock, highlight your name with the yellow highlighter. Okay? If your name's not highlighted, I will not let them know that you're taking the test because here's what's going to happen when I get back tonight. They're going to go ahead and push your exams out to the box 
the uh, server I've got in the other room, or the other box over there, it's going to push those out and you're going to be pre-configured and ready to take the test tomorrow. If somebody wants to add that in tomorrow, we can't do it. Because one, I don't have internet access, but secondly, they don't have you registered for the test. Okay? So we'll need to know between now and 2 o'clock that you want to take the test. So again, please sign this and please highlight it if you're planning. You still have to sign it. Everybody has to sign it. You know, if nobody takes it tomorrow, I'm just going to have the day off. No, I get to do an hour review in the morning and then, no. We still have now, some are you going to review some of the performance-based questions at all? I may have a chance to do that this afternoon. We'll see how much time we got. But some of those were exploding. We have class Okay. Let's talk morning. about disaster recovery, disaster planning, disaster recovery. So in this chapter, we're going to take a look at business continuity planning and disaster recovery plan. We are also going to take a look at fault tolerance and recovery. Also going to take a look at how to respond to a security incident. So let's begin with business continuity. So let's talk about some continuity planning, how to create a business continuity plan, how to create and test your disaster recovery. So one, I'm a little disappointed in the way that they did this. They should have placed the business impact analysis above the business continuity plan because you need the BIA first before you go into anything else. The business impact analysis is going to take a look at assessing my critical business functions. What do I have in each of my departments that's critical? Every department should know what their critical pieces of equipment are. I like to, to mark mine that are most critical with the number five, and they just go all the way down to zero. So if it's something like a printer, it's a zero. That's not a critical piece of equipment. However, there are some people that feel opposite. There are some CEOs that feel their printer is their best friend. So you always got to take a look at it and say, what do we need to keep in business? If we are going to go ahead and move this to another location, how can we get back up and running as quickly as possible? The business impact analysis is going to take a look at all those critical pieces of equipment, and we are going to compare those to all the threats that we have. So we're going to take a look at those threats of ice storms, um, a bursting water pipe, power outages, no internet. By the way, if you have no internet and no Facebook, you do not call 911. That is not an emergency. In one little town, they had Facebook go down for a while. There were 12 calls to 911 saying Facebook is down. Sorry, kid, this is not an emergency. It is to them. I was on a flight to Hawaii, and a 15-year-old girl sitting next to me kept looking at her phone after we took off because she wasn't getting any responses back to the pictures she put up there. She goes, my friends don't like me anymore. I said, no, I don't think the uh, cell signal likes you because we're far enough away from the states that you have no cell signal. And she looked at me like her whole world fell apart. She's like, no, what am I going to do? And just then her mom in front of me sits, uh, stands up and she goes, would you like to trade places? Because I think I need to console my daughter. And I'm like, all right then, yes, this is good. <laughs> Think about that business impact analysis. What are those threats that we have out there? What is the probability that that threat is going to come to fruition and actually happen? So we're going to go ahead and say what's most likely, what's next most likely, and we're going to take it all the way down to what's the least likely thing that's going to happen. That's all my business impact analysis. We take that information and from that we write the business continuity plan. We go into the continuity plan looking at the risks, the controls, the service restoration procedures. How are we going to get ourselves back on our feet and keep running after this disruption? Now remember, business continuity is for disruption, not for the disaster. So when you take a look at something like Harvey when it hit, that was a disruption, but the disruption lasted long enough that it became a disaster. So the business continuity plan is the first part of the document, the back half of the document is the disaster recovery plan. We're going to move to the disaster recovery plan 
once we decide that there's a triggering mechanism that says this is no longer disruption, this is now a disaster. So that's what we look at. We always think about the IT contingency plan. What can I do to make this work so that we can get this done? I have to say I have the most exciting job in the world because every week when I'm on the road somewhere teaching, there's some sort of contingency plan that has to be put into place so we can figure out how to get you the information that you need, get an overhead projector working, get a computer working. I mean, it's, it is really fun for me because I never know what ne next week is going to bring. So there's always this contingency. I have a great support staff at Phoenix TS. I can call Will, I can call uh, Brian, I can say, hey, this isn't working. What do you want to do? What if you tried this, this, and this? I didn't think about that. So bouncing ideas off other people, especially in the IT department, is what we do to get ourselves back up and running. So your IT needs to always be running. The COOP, the Continuity of Operations Plan, procedures for temporary site during recovery. Where can we go to come up and run? Do we have a hot site, warm site, cold site? Do we have the owner's garage? Do I have a co-location? Is there some place else I can go that is not being affected by whatever's happening, where we can go set up and continue to work because right now the things we have don't work. You also have to think about crisis communication plan. If power's gone out, you might have a tough time being able to connect to somebody else because the cell towers are down. It may be that your landlines are down as well. So you can just hope that eventually your phone system is going to come back up and they can call you and let you know how quickly they can be there. But again, if there's a crisis that's occurring at your office, it's probably also affecting them as well. We talked a little bit about succession planning. And if we have upper management team going overseas in a plane, we want to make sure that they are on different planes. We might put two on one plane, two or, two or three on another plane. But should one of the planes go down, we want to make sure that the business can still maintain its course through life and stay running and stay functioning. If your entire upper management team has gone down on a plane, there may not be anybody at the office who knows how to keep this business going. So succession planning becomes important. Remember, we were talking about using this to keep copies of everybody's private key in an escrow service should we need to access that if something were to happen. In creating my business continuity plan, the first thing I want to do is perform a risk assessment, much like we would do for a normal security planning op that we might do. We create the business impact analysis. So again, we're looking at all the different risks and how they might affect us. Once I have created that business impact analysis, I then design the business continuity plan and the supporting recovery plans and controls. Next, I'm going to implement and test the plan. Finally, analyze the results to apply for the refinement. Do you need to go send that? Can you send it to your email? I'll just go. Or just uh, yeah, you can email. send it to me, but you want to send it to Alea. Okay, I'll see you on it. Okay, thank you. So in creating our business impact analysis, the first thing that we want to do is identify the functions critical to sustain those business operations. What are my critical functionalities? If you're working for the Social Security Department, what is your number one critical function up there? Numbers. What's that? Numbers. numbers? What kind of numbers? Marshall. That might be it. There's something more important, though. Money, sending out checks on a monthly basis. How many elderly do you have that get either a check once a month or have that direct deposit showing up who on the first of next month will not have any food on their table or any heating oil to heat their homes if they don't get that check? So yeah, sending out checks is their number one critical functionality. So you always have to be able to identify that. You need to be able to look and say, here's what we need to do to sustain our business operations. We need to identify the resources used by each of our critical functions to get this done. Social Security sends all their checks out of their facility up here in Baltimore on the 
once a year, what they do is they go ahead and, and say, let's replicate this out to our other four, 17 facilities throughout the country and let's make sure they can pass out checks as well. So they do a, a cross check to make sure that what they're sending out at those locations is identical as to what's being sent out, or would have been sent out from their main location. So you want to prioritize those critical functions. What of those is the most important? Which one is the least important? Identify the threats to each of your functions. Determine the mitigation techniques that you can do for each and every threat that's out there. For some of these threats, there isn't much we can do to mitigate this. If you think about something that's happening naturally, such as a flood, fire, uh, ice storm, wind storm, not much we can do to mitigate that. What we can do is look at it and say, is there another location we can move to where they don't have quite <coughs> as severe of threats as we have here? As we think about the disaster recovery plans, we think about the system documents. Who's got copies of the documents? Where are those located? So we look at the user credentials and the software keys that we've got. So we want to make sure that we've got that software documentation. So when we move to that new location, we've got all that so we can get rolling on that. Reserve the resources. Any replacement parts, redundant systems, or alternate sites that we might go to become real important to us so we know the types of sites that we're going to. What is a cold site? What's in my cold site? The same equipment you have in your normal site, except it's not manned or turned on. Actually, there's no equipment at all. There's no chairs, there's no tables, there's no equipment. There is a wall here, a wall there, a wall there, a wall there, a floor and a ceiling. There's power and there's HVAC. And that's it. How do I know this? I taught in one of these things. They sent me out to Butte, Montana. Some call it Butte, because it's spelled B-U-T-T-E. A friend of mine from Australia calls it Butte, Montana. Cold, 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 cold. There was nothing in this room. They actually picked me up at my hotel on Sunday morning and said, we need to go out to Missoula, Montana to pick up the chairs and tables for your classroom. Really, chairs and tables? This does not sound good. So they got the chairs and tables and said, well, now we need to go get the computers and the, the switches and the routers. And I went, nope. You can deliver those tomorrow morning. I'll help you set them up. But I'm not, gonna, I'm not missing the Super Bowl for this. I didn't sign up to do the setup. I, did the, I do the teaching, not the setup for you guys. So one of the things to take a look at with a cold site is the fact that you have nothing in there. As you move into the warm site, you have all the tables and chairs. You've got a few computer systems and a few servers running, maybe a tape backup unit, and you may have internet connectivity. As we move to the hot site, with the hot site, you're ready to go in about two hours. So you've got everything here, all the tables and chairs, all the computer systems, all of your servers. All we need is the latest tape backup to roll that in or back up and running. If I'm running a co-location, I have a replica of every piece of equipment at this location from my main location. Every change made at the main location is replicated here immediately. I can jump right from that system to this system and we are good to go. As we think about some of the replacement parts or redundant systems, Think about your vendor. If you've bought enough equipment from someone like Cisco and you've got some older switches and the flooding came in and wiped out your switches and your routers, your firewalls and your access points, pick up the phone, call your vendor. Hey, Cisco, this is Eric. Yeah, we've done $2 million worth of business every month with you for the last 10 years. I need replicas of all my equipment. We just had a big flood. They will not only provide that for me, They'll ask, where would you like me to drop this off? I can give them the address of my off-site facility. They will deliver it to that off-site facility. All I need is the operating system and the configuration to put on each one of those, and we're good to go. What's that? I don't need a credit card. They're doing this out of the goodness of their heart. This is all old equipment. This is stuff that's in their warehouse. So this is one of the things that we always think about with our vendors. If you've got a good relationship with you, they will not charge you. It's kind of like if you go to the bar 
you've been going to that same bar for a long time and you've always left a nice tip and you walk in one day and you say, hey, can I get a couple shots? I don't have any money. They'll probably pour you a couple shots. Why? Because you've taken care of them before. I don't know about you, but that works for me. Can I borrow your uniform? No, I would never do that. Um, yeah, that's cool. Uh, backup policies. Where are your backups located? Who's got access to them? Can we get that backup over to my off-site facility? So that's my concern. Can I get that over there? What are my recovery procedures? We talked about the fact that you know, our disruption, our disaster may have affected the people that wrote those procedures that we've got. So we need someone who can actually set up that recovery procedure and get us back online. Personnel list is always important to us. Within that personal list, personnel list is going to be the phone numbers of the people that we're going to try to get hold of so they can come back in and help us get this all set up. But remember, this is a disaster. It will also affect their lives and their families' lives as well. So you always got to think that you're probably only going to get about 10% of your employees helping you out. We should have a list of emergency contact numbers. And again, we always have to be concerned about the fact that you may not be able to get hold of somebody in a disaster because that disaster may have affected the phone systems as well. When we start thinking about doing testing on our business continuity plan and disaster recovery plan. Thank you, sir. How many people we got for tomorrow? Four. Four people. Four people. Excellent. And those people that passed are going to tell everybody else, you should have taken it because it was the easy one. It's the every other Friday really, really, really easy exam. So we have a couple ways of testing the business continuity plan and disaster recovery plan. It could just be a checklist. The way the checklist works would be HR has their business continuity disaster recovery plan in their hand. They're just going to sit there and review it. Hey, yeah, this would work. That's a checklist. That's just how easy a checklist is. Better to do a tabletop exercise. This is where you bring in the heads of all departments. They all bring in their business continuity plan, disaster recovery plan for their department. They get to sit and talk about, here are my critical pieces of equipment. We've got copies of them already at our other location. Here's what I would do if I were to walk through this. They're basically doing the checklist test, but they're doing it in front of a group of people. This gives upper management the idea that each department head has an understanding of what they need to do to get this done. We can do a simulation test, a small or large scale response test under controlled circumstances. It is much better instead of doing any of these, actually do a parallel test. We're gonna stay up and running here. We're gonna go out to the other location and we're gonna come up over there. Do we get the same things coming up at both locations? Are we replicating everything over there that we have here? You don't want to do a full interruption test. A full interruption test says, at my main facility, I'm going to grab the power lever outside, and I'm going to yank it down, and I'm going to shut down power here. And we're just going to see if we can come back up at the other location. This is a disaster about to happen. You get to witness your own disaster. Because the moment you shut it down here, you're probably going into a disaster state in the next 10 minutes because you just shut down some servers that are in the middle of running. You didn't stop to think about how you're bringing everything down here. Now you have to get up over there. If you can't get up over there, you really have a disaster because you're not up there and you're not up here and you just mess things up here and you can't replicate and get back up over there. So the best thing to do is just to simply say, look, let's just take ourselves offline here. Let's come up over there. Can we continue doing over there what we were doing here? So by doing this parallel test, it is much better. So it's also going to create less headaches and wreak, ha wreak less havoc with people when you do this. 
Okay, we got a couple questions for you here. What document specifically covers moving operations to a temporary site? That is my continuity of operations. Okay. What document is a business most likely to have more than one of? Probably a disaster recovery plan. Why? Because I might have multiple services, multiple locations. I also have multiple departments. Each department's probably going to have their own version of what they need for a business, uh, a disaster recovery plan. Uh, what is also known as a structured walkthrough? As my tabletop exercise is gathering the team or department together to review the plan and walk through the theoretical disaster step by step. Let's go ahead and take a short break. When we come back, we will continue on. I've got to call the office just to make sure they got all that information.